Now, Africa Day is observed annually on 25th May to commemorate the founding of the Organization of Africa Unity, OAU, precursor of the African Union. The day provides an opportunity to recite the political and socio-economic achievements of African governments and African citizens. Joining us now is Eniola Harrison, a seasoned communication professional committed to Africa's transformation through strategic communication. She's the founder of HDH Consulting and Services, a Brussels-based communication consultancy. And she's the co-founder of Africa Communications Week. Also joining us is Farai Muvuti, political analyst of the so South Africa Times. Good to have you both. Okay. Thank you, Farai. Yeah, great, great to have you. Now, I'll start with Eniola. Um, Eniola, I'm sure you were monitoring some of the conversations that were had so far. Um, we had to leave them at some point. But what was your impression of, of where the conversation was going generally? So in terms of, um, of Africa Day yes. um, and in terms of um, today, basically, you know, one of the things that's really, really important um, is to magnify and to amplify the stories that we're telling about Africa's transformation. Um, you know, these stories must be told with our voices. Africa's reputation has a bottom line effect. It impacts everything from investment to exports to foreign policies, you know, are starkly demonstrated in the past year public health communicators. Um, and this is what Africa Communications Week actually does um, during this, this week of Africa Day when we're celebrating Africa Day. We're talking about, you know, perceptions about the continent. We're talking about bringing together uh, communication professionals to think about how the work that we, we do, um, you know, impacts the narrative about the continent um, and how we can all collaborate effectively um, to drive that transformation, to drive that socioeconomic development. Mm. And Farai, to you, strengthening Africa's transformation agenda or changing the African narrative, is that just a function of how we tell our stories and who tells them? Yeah, uh, precisely. Um, it is it is a critical aspect of of, of that. Uh, it's uh, it's important to do so and to also be nuanced as we tell these stories, because over the years the narrative has been radically uh, uh, been based on uh, issues pertaining to strife. You do not see a decolonial contextualized argument around the actual hopeful issues that are happening in Africa. We see one sided pictures which tend to focus primarily on a narrative narrative of poverty or narrative of, 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 of disadvantage. But yet, we have a lot of things that are happening for us. We have, uh, we have a fintech companies that are growing, a huge number of investment going into Africa that is actually domestic-based. We've had, we've had an incredible amount of uh, uh, growth in terms of economic growth. We, ha we have currently the diaspora, the African diaspora, actually contributes collectively, according to World Bank numbers, more than what we, what we get in FDI, as well as what we get um, in, in through foreign development aid, and these are stories. These are stories and narratives that are not seen. So you almost see a picture of vulnerability of Africa. So it's very crucial, and I agree with the, my my, uh, my colleague, my, my the previous speaker, how critical and crucial it is that we control these narratives by not only telling it ourselves, but equally shaping and ensuring that as it's distributed, it's challenged out there equally. Okay, um, Aniela, uh, forgive me, I had presumed you were following us in the conversation, the UBA conversation, so I was infer referring to that. But going back to something you've said, Africa's transformation begins with the many stories we choose to tell, and those stories must be told with our voices. And I want to ask, because um, Farai just talked about uh, Africans in diaspora, what is the African voice? Since uh, at this point in our development, we've had a la layers of influences that shape the African. I mean, you know, the, the truth of the matter is that, you know, the voices, African voices are uh, diverse and they're varied. So there is no single story. There's no single African voice, you know, if you will. Of course, when we refer to the continent, we, we refer to it in its totality. But these voices, they include voices from the diaspora. They include voices that are not only in English, you know, they're also in French, they're also in Portuguese, they're in many different languages. Um, and they're coming across in different spaces. So we're talking about the media, we're talking about entertainment, you know, we're talking about corporate organizations, nonprofits, really, you know, um, the collective voice um, of Africans 
around the world um, in different spaces. That's what we refer to as um, as the African uh, voice and narrative. And this narrative is, uh, you know, it's evolving, it's changing. It's not as, um, I would say, we're seeing an evolution. We've seen an evolution over the past few years, but more needs to be done. Um, we need to step up our action, um, a little bit maybe less of talk and more of action, particularly around owning our media. Um, I think this is one of the first steps that we can begin to take in shaping you know, in shaping the stories that come out about the continent, in shaping, you know, the the, the narratives, in shaping the kinds of, you know, views that we want to see uh, about ourselves. And I think owning media is one step that we can begin to take. Um, there is a lot of economics that also goes behind this, right? So it's not just about, you know, the, the stories, but there's a lot of um, economics as well. Yeah. Indeed. Uh, Farai, I wonder if you agree with Eniola, but i also like to ask you, because while there are so many things we can be proud of or, as Africans on a day like this, by the way, happy Africa Day to both of you. Mm. Uh, we <laughs> cannot really ignore, true. we certainly cannot ignore the conflict, the hunger, the political instability in some parts. As we speak, there's uncertainty in Mali about a coup. So Farai, let me ask you about the role of our regional bodies. Daniela talked about how the media has a role to play, yes. But what about the regional bodies such as the African Union, uh, the ECOWAS, and the rest of them on the continent? How do you think they've fared in promoting uh, uh, you know, a peace, peaceful Africa, uh, one that will celebrate our diversity? How have they fared in promoting economic growth, political stability, have they done well? Well, listen, um, uh, a very good question that you're asking here, because the question really is, I, I think we tend to conflate two issues. When we say that reportage around Africa should, should be reshaped or rather be reformed, we're not saying that the bad stories aren't to be told. We're simply saying that as they are told, they should be nuanced. You should dis display the complexities, the regional complexities. We should not simply say it is a corrupt or there is bad or there is good. Stories are not that simple. We're talking about nations that have histories that are formed by multiple issues that have histories that, that, uh, that, that, that equally feed into the present. So without, so our duty as communicators is to tell the story from its historical context so as when one reads the present, they read it through a filtered, well-balanced and, and with equal comprehension of the complexities of those regions and those countries thereof. It, it, you don't simply hear a story of Greece, for example, that, you know, purely because, you know, there, are, uh, there, is, uh, there, you know, there has been an issue relating to economic uh, meltdown, that that is, you know, Greece has failed as a government. We don't hear that. We hear the complexities of the central, the central, the, the, the central government there in terms of the EU funding. We hear the, the issue issues relating to uh, uh, to its history with 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 uh, with its marketplace we hear the uh, the injection of of all banking and so forth the story is told but we don't see the same thing as it pertains to africa you simply see, you simply see a brandishing of one particular narrative it may be corruption or it may be the case that it's a failed state or you hear the issues of regime you don't hear the issues of regimes in europe oh no you know but yet Europe since it has multiple complexities as well. So we're simply saying that as these stories are told, they should be filtered through a nuanced, well-balanced uh, narrative that equally enables people to understand the histories. Now, directly to your question relating to the coup and, and, and ECOWAS, I would put it this way to simplify the question, to your answer. Africa is not L.A., okay, nor is it Baghdad. <laughs> okay. So in terms of the performance of ECOWAS, one has to read it from its history. We have seen quite a huge amount of development. There have been, we have, we have lesser civil wars than we've ever had in Africa compared, compared to the 1980s. The, the, the level of crisis that we see right now is quite contextualized to a time of progression, you know, if you are to look at it through the lens of history. Okay. And it also harks on to uh, the, what, what this very day, uh, you know, people like Nkwame Nkrumah, we envisioned this type of Africa that we would like to see. And what, what, what was the one area that he spoke of? He says the, he, he, he spoke of the importance of building regional structures, right, that feed out from, you know, a collective continental unity, unitarian approach, right? And I think that it's not just a, 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 a regional 
continental issue, but it's equally a continental issue. So how we read these issues, we must not separate the continental performance thereof. Okay, so it's important to read it as as it is and and speaking to this specific issue i think as it continues to develop and if you if you are not uh, and let us not forget the external forces that play in be it the french and so forth right so these issues are quite complicated but given time i think we might see a better outcome okay uh this is to you and your land not to be seeming to be touting once uh, one side of the narrative but what do you say to those who would say that our failure so far to shape our own narrative is merely a reflection of our failure in other spheres, whether economic or political. And then on the back of that, would you see then taking charge of the narrative and changing the narrative as a tool? I know uh, Farai spoke of telling the nuanced story and telling it in the historical context as a tool of inspiration, even in the midst of our still making wrong decisions. That's a really that's a really good uh, a good question. Um, I definitely do not see it as a failure, um, you know, in the same way. Maybe potentially there are failures in in other ways. Um, I think that you know, just in terms of if you look at history, there's also a progression. There's you know, there's an awakening, and there needs to be an investment. It's more of a focus in this particular area. It's also about understanding that there is a link between perception and even economic development. Because I think that historically, you know, we, we're, we're more focused on, you know, the, the, the challenges, you know, the problems that we've had to face without actually realizing that with data to support that, that there's actually a link. This actually affects the bottom line. Your reputation, the country's reputation affects the bottom line. And I think that as more and more governments, as more and more, you know, uh, professionals, um, industry begins to take, you know, are, um, are beginning to recognize how important this is and how linked it is, for example, to FDI flows, you know, risk perception that is that is directly linked to FDI flows, then there will be more investment in this area. We have we have skilled professionals who are, we have more than enough skilled professionals across the continent who are doing this at the corporate level. They're managing brands, they're managing, you know, corporate reputations. So this is also the same sort of thing that we can be doing at the country level. And I think that government um, uh, professionals as well just need to recognize that there is a link. It isn't just, um, you know, the thing you keep at the back burner, but it actually should be at the forefront of the mm. development agenda. There are certain countries across the continent that do take this seriously at the governmental level, and we can see how they're actually managing and shaping their reputation. You know, um, right. take Ghana, for instance, um, example, or take Rwanda uh, as an example. These are countries that are actively managing their reputation because they have realized and recognized that there is that link. So I think that there, it's, it's beginning, um, and we hope that we will begin to see this um, you know, take shape um, in the future. And as to your second question, yes, I think that it is a tool. I think that it is an absolute tool. I think that, you know, it, you know, this is a really great opportunity right now. We are, you know, at a really, I think, important nexus where we as communication professionals, we in the media can begin to actively, you know, use communication, use media to shape these stories. Um, Africa's time is now, I mean, even on the global stage, we have um, we have um, fantastic uh, entertainment. We have fantastic culture and the power of culture um, to really begin to change how people view um, a country, a people, a nation, well, I think is very well said. Eniola Harrison and Farai Movuti, thank you so much. And once again, happy Africa Day to both of you.